For our last segment, we want to check in with some of our communities across some different regions of our state. And we have two more wonderful guests with us tonight. Joe Fredericks, who's news editor at WTIP North Shore Community Radio. And we have Obala Obala, a city council candidate tonight from Austin. Thanks to you both for being here. We really appreciate it. I had a question for both of you. Uh, for folks that aren't from your area, how does your area typically lean? How do people typically vote? And are you feeling like there are going to be any significant changes? Uh, maybe you could start, Joe. Sure. Uh, well, typically Cook County here where Graham Ray is, where WTIP, the radio station where I work, is located. Uh, typically it goes Democrat uh, for in uh, 2012, for example, it went for Obama by 23 points and in 2016 for Hillary Clinton, I think, by 22. So typically uh, is a Democratic county, Cook County. Uh, doesn't represent, though, the, the 8th district, 8th congressional district as a whole uh, has mm -hmm changed uh, here in, in recent years. Uh, it went for Obama uh, by, uh, five, I think, five and a half percent in, and then uh, changed to Trump in, in 2016 by 15 points. So there's been a change in the 8th Congressional District, which is a massive district here in northern Minnesota, uh, but uh, Cook County, where the radio station is located, Graham Ray and so forth, uh, Democratic. On Obama? Oh, I can't quite hear you. I'm not sure if I'm the only one. Are you muted? Yes, I was okay. muted. <laughs> That's I, okay. I, Please I, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would say most area of Southern East here, especially Austin in Moa County, um, mm -hmm. I would say uh, the voting, the voters here is kind of uh, diverse. Um, uh, I would say most of the voters, they are Republican and others are, 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 are Repub uh, Democrat and Republican. Uh, but for the, the last for the last uh, few years, uh, the Senate and the state representative uh, has been uh, Democrat, uh, which is uh, Jean Papi and uh, uh, Dennis Park. So uh, we don't know how the changes will ship this year. Yeah, Obala, I mean, I wanted to thank you for joining us, first of all. And I wanted to speak with you about the immigrant communities in Austin. A lot of times when we hear of immigrants, we're only thinking about the Twin Cities area, not really a greater Minnesota. So tell us a little bit more about uh, these communities. Uh, where are they coming from? Uh, what kind of work are they doing? And also, are there immigrants who are running for offices aside from you? Of course, you're running for a city council seat in Austin. How about other folks? Do we have people who are already uh, serving as elected officials in, in the area? Uh, first of all, I want to say uh, thank you, uh, Ibrahim, and uh, also the NPR for um, hosting this and uh, helping me uh, to be part of this um, uh, presentation today. Uh, Austin, Austin area, most of the immigrant that um, been to Austin, most of them come from Ethiopia, uh, South Sudan, uh, Burmese, uh, uh, Puerto Rico, Guatemala, and uh, and some other part of West Africa, which is uh, Benin, Togo, uh, um, Benin, Togo. Those are the most area, and also uh, uh, Mexico here in our border. So, and most of the immigrants those come in Austin specific. They are attracted by uh, because of the jobs that Austin offer here, uh, uh, especially by Ormel and uh, QPP and other local. Um, uh, business, so uh, such as Mayo. So those are the uh, reason why immigrant move to Austin is to get job at those uh, uh, food process industry. Yeah, and of course, as I said earlier on, you are running for an office, and I was interested in learning a little bit about why you get into uh, politics, especially in Austin. Is it because uh, people who uh, you know of immigrant background kind of feel left out in, in, in when it comes to representation in local offices? Well, I, I, I think that wasn't uh, mainly the case uh, when I decided to run for um, office in Austin here. I moved to Austin, Minnesota in 2015 and since then I become so involved in the community and um, I get the support from everyone, uh, from the mayor, from the city council and other uh, commissioner. So I become just and um, active citizen uh, in the community and and uh, I got involved mainly working in um, uh, statewide uh, for um, 
for a student. But since I'm done with the school now, I see like there are a lot of need to do represent uh, representation for a uh, young uh, generation. So to bring a, a new voice to the city council. And uh, I will say it, I get encouraged by the current city council and also by the mayor. And I'm like, okay, I think maybe this is the time to, um, to try this. So, and that's why I decided to run. And uh, uh, what was it like, I mean, to, to run for an office when you are the, probably the first and the only um, right now, um, a black uh, immigrant running for office in Austin? What was your yeah, experience it, like? Yeah, it, it, it's quite interesting uh, because uh, Austin has established in, um, in 1868 uh, and since then we have never seen any person of color uh, uh, who have been elected in the office uh, of all these years. And uh, most of the immigrants uh, who live here, um, they have not uh, contested for any office. Austin uh, for almost, it had been only um, uh, white. Um, and uh, the last 30 years, Austin has uh, substantially changed um, with uh, immigrant moving in. And for me, uh, when I when I first decided to uh, announce myself, I was kind of nervous because um, I I see no one look like me, but I'm like, what will the community say? Even if the current leader are uh, encouraging me to um, uh, jump in and try my best, you know, what will the, uh, what will the community say? And then that nervous went away after I announced myself and I'm like, uh, it's all about the work. America is a great country whereby if you come with a big dream, you can make your dream to come true. And then when I announced myself, that nervousness went away. And right now I'm just rolling it and I'm just waiting for the result, uh, whatever it comes. Yeah, and, and I know Obala that you ran, I think you announced um, uh, that you were running a couple of days or a couple of months after you became a citizen. Can you just talk a little bit about your journey um, uh, from a refugee camp to becoming a citizen and now to running for an office in Austin? Yeah, I, I was originally born in Ethiopia. I, I, I grew up uh, in Ethiopia uh, until the age 10. But in 2003, uh, December 13, when uh, genocide happened in my uh, homeland in Gambela, uh, my family and I, we fled the country and ran to Kenya. So the last uh, um, 10 years we've been living in a refugee camp whereby uh, the hope only is to come to America to get a better life. And uh, so my journey, all my life I've been running. And uh, in 2013, we finally made it to uh, the promised land, which is the America. And then, and last year, December uh, 17, I officially become a US citizen. And through that, I already consider myself before as a US citizen before I even become a citizen because I've been involved, I've been helping uh, uh, out with everything. But when I get that certificate, I'm like, finally, I can call myself, I'm a, I'm a proud American citizen and I can do anything to make this country thrive and uh, be welcoming in this great nation. So, and now I jump my name in the, uh, in the city council race for the first time and it has been amazing so far. Wonderful. Congratulations um, on your journey. Joe, I wondered if I could talk with you about what types of national attention your areas received in terms of presidential candidates, um, a hot congressional race, perhaps. Uh, what, what's it looking like there? What's it looked like this uh, election cycle? Sure. Well, in Grand Marais, we, you know, it's a small town here, of course. Uh, anybody that's been to Grand Marais or the North Shore, that we don't get uh, presidential candidates uh, that come and campaign here in town, but they uh, both have been here, Biden and Trump, to northern Minnesota a number mm -hmm. of times in, in Duluth and over on the Iron Range and so forth, but uh, not particularly here in, in our community or in Cook County. Uh, you know, but some of the issues certainly of relevance to us, our backyard is the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness and, and that issue around uh, twin metals and proposed copper nickel mines in northern Minnesota have been, you know, hot button issues for, for certainly uh, both candidates on a, on a national scale and, and drawn a lot of national attention. So even though it's not necessarily, you know, here or, or proposed here that it's more on the Ely side, it, it's still of great significance to us and, and our listeners here at WTIP and so forth. Uh, so that that's one aspect of it that, you know, the environment is such a 
a key resource in, in some of the issues here for, for northern Minnesota and a lot of that having to do with uh, mining and, and the logging and just industry like that uh, that does play on a national level which is uh, you know a, a local issue for us here certainly at the very least regional and uh, you know when it trickles down from from a national level to maybe more state politics uh, tonight we're following very closely here at WTIP uh, the District 3 race in the state Senate, Tom Bach, and uh, he's being challenged this year by um, Chris Hogan, a, another resident here from uh, near the North Shore, and then also District 3A House seat for Minnesota is uh, Rob Eklund, and he's being challenged by uh, Thomas Manon, who's uh, another uh, uh, younger guy for the GOP, uh, Thomas Manning, and we've interviewed all these candidates and, and there's a lot of interest around those issues, you know, mining and uh, timber and so forth, that uh, that national issue, you know, very much uh, plays out in our state uh, politics as well. And, and oddly enough, though, uh, not as much in some of the local races, things like county commissioner or, or the mayor or city council, uh, those issues don't necessarily get mentioned at all by candidates, even on our forums that we host on the radio station. Uh, some of those issues that, you know, we're just get a little more hyper local and things like housing and mm -hmm. um, issues like that, uh, as opposed to the overall like twin metals or something wasn't discussed by any of the candidates this time around. Well, I think you raise an interesting point about the importance of our local, state, and federal governments and the different issues and the different ways that our different levels of government contribute to our everyday lives. I wonder, too, how uh, voting was looking in your area today, because we, we saw some long lines in the Twin Cities on some of the early voting days, two, three-hour lines at times. What does it look like in your area, or what did it look like? Well, we do absentee or, or vote by mail for most Cook County residents traditionally, uh, not related to the pandemic or requesting mm -hmm. those as absentee ballots uh, for Cook County outside of Grand Marais, I should say. Uh, so traditionally, we do mail in ballots. In, in Grand Marais, though, uh, a record number of where people go to the polls on Election Day, a record number of absentee ballots requested this year. Uh, our auditor told us of, of there's approximately 975 registered voters in, in Grand Marais that uh, 600 30, I believe, approximately uh, requested absentee ballots, and of those, 90% had been returned by 5 o'clock yesterday. So a, a massive turnout. Of, you know, Minnesota always takes a, a great amount of pride in our high mm -hmm. voter turnout, and Cook County is always at, near or at the top of the list for counties uh, as far as a percentage of, of voters and people that vote. So a huge turnout once again. I think it was at 84% already had returned their ballots this year and voted uh, registered voters. So a uh, high turnout in Cook County, but not at the polls per se. Uh, a lot of absentee ballots are vote by mail, as I said. Uh, yeah, but, you know, what, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted, I know that we have a few minutes and Obala, I wanted to bring you in here. Um, you know, what was it like to run for an office in, 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 in during the pandemic? Um, were you able to do the campaign in the normal way that, that people did when we weren't in this? Or how did you think, how did you, how did you change things around? I, I, I think um, our campaign during pandemic has really become a big challenge for, uh, especially for new, um, you know, um, uh, elect office, those who are starting for the first time. Uh, for me personally, it's kind of uh, something really difficult because um, I'm used to watching, um, you know, candidate uh, making crowd and going to people, talking to them, uh, door knocking. But during this pandemic was really difficult because um, uh, the, uh, the, the voters, they are afraid of themselves so that they don't get, uh, uh, you know, uh, the virus. And me, myself, I have to be, you know, uh, concerned too about the voters. So the only thing that play a big role to, uh, throughout my campaign is uh, social media, is uh, using Facebook as the only tool to reach out and also some texting with uh, some friends. Uh, when uh, Throughout when the campaign get closer, I did some door knocking, you know, delivering some flyers and do the yard sign. I think that was uh, the biggest thing we have done, but uh, I did not have the opportunity at all to talk to voters at the same time and uh, make a big speech while uh, they're mm -hmm. listening to me. So everything was uh, throughout the social media. That's interesting. And it takes a lot of resourcefulness, I'm sure, to to run a campaign like that. Uh, we just have a couple minutes left, but I did want to end by asking both of you, uh, looking to the future, what are your, your hopes for 
the, the regions of the state that you're in. Joe? Uh, my hopes for the region that I'm in. Uh, well, we've seen, you know, some of the uh, divisiveness trickle into our, our local politics. Uh, we had some yard signs uh, being stolen and so forth over the summer and some contentiousness. But, you know, I think there's also been a lot of attention focused on our mayoral race. I know that uh, NPR has done a story about uh, J. Earl Smith Deku when he was elected in the young city council that we have here and uh, that there's a, a tight race for mayor tonight that we're following very closely. And uh, there's some there's uh, people coming together on that, uh, not expressed in many races across the country where whoever wins, we're in good shape. Both candidates have expressed that. And it's a, it's a remarkable story that got a lot of attention across the state. And that we move forward here, it's a small community here in Cook County and Grand Marais, and that uh, no matter who wins any of the races tonight, that uh, we, we step forward, you know, regardless of what happens with the presidential election or some of these state offices that I mentioned that, you know, with Cook County and what we do at the radio station here at WTIP is really about community and that uh, we can, we can you know, build a, a strong foundation no matter who wins tonight. And I think that, that all the candidates would, would agree with that sentiment. Wonderful. What about there in Austin, Obalum? Yeah, uh, I, I think here in Austin, me personally, I tell the voters uh, a few days ago, no matter what the outcome of this election, uh, we have to move forward as a country, as one country, because uh, we this country has been found on democracy. Like me personally, my civic engagement will not end here. Uh, either the victory come my way tonight or tomorrow, I will still continue mm -hmm. to work with my uh, opponent if I will not be uh, uh, the, the, the elect uh, city Council. My work will still continue. I will still join the, the, the City Council meeting. I will still going around to the community. But one thing I want to say about my uh, my running for office here, this is me myself to make it this far. This is a victory for me already because uh, when I see some of my friends back in refugee and see my work like uh, Obala who just been in America for seven years mm -hmm. and now I am at this level, they feel so proud and, and they uh, holding to that American dream that there is still hope that we will go to America and one day I will be like Obala. I feel I mm -hmm. feel so happy to be where I am, serving as a, a student leader statewide to represent the 180,000 uh, uh, community college in Minnesota. That's give me a huge experience and the, the governor recently appointed me at board of trustee. I think I have done uh, a lot and uh, no matter what the outcome will come today, I think this is something that I'm so proud uh, for and uh, my daughter, Thank Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you very so. much. We, we do have to go in just a couple of minutes, but we really appreciate both of you for coming on tonight. And thank you for sharing your stories of, of your parts of your state. And we just want to make sure that uh, everybody in our state feels like they're included in our coverage at Sahan Journal and at NPR News. So we really appreciate you both taking the time tonight. Thank you. My and, uh, <laughs> sure. Well, that's going to do it for us. This really flew by, Ibrahim, and it was so nice to check in with Minnesotans across the state. And thank you so much for for doing this with me tonight. No, it's an honor to really um, work with uh, NPR and with you and, uh, you know, bring our uh, people together tonight so that they can share our uh, their stories. So. Yeah, and we're going to have continued coverage on Sahan Journal and NPR News 91.1 and also online uh, on both of our news organizations' websites.